Welcome everybody to Movement Choirs and the Collective Effervescence of Dance. This is the third of our webinars for um, Global Water Dances. We started with Global, then we did Water, and this is Dances, okay? So um, I just wanted to give a plug to Global Water Dances because that's really what we're going to be talking about today um and introduce Vanya Ibarguen who is over there weaving you want to unmute and say something <clears throat> hello everybody welcome good morning good afternoon or good evening depending where are you in the world we are very happy that you are here and really excited about this wonderful meeting with three amazing women Karen, Cecilia, and Rebecca. Welcome, everybody. And I know that we have Mary Lee here, who's on the steering committee, and I believe Natasha is here somewhere. There's Natasha. Yay. Hi. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Great. Hello. 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 And Gretchen Dunn, also on our steering committee there. Is that it? Is that everybody? Okay. All right. Um, and we're going to, um, what we're going to share with you today is um, a lot of the research that Rebecca and Chechi and I have done and the conversations we've been having about the value of the movement choir, collective effervescence, and social neuroscience. Our presentation has clips from um, the documentary called Ripples and Reflections. So we've got little bits and pieces of that documentary uh, embedded into this pre presentation. Um, I'm going to ask that um, everybody stay muted the entire time and that you hold your questions. So you write them down because what we have planned is about an hour's worth of presentation, which is chock full of stuff. And then we will have we're hoping to have almost an hour of discussion, conversation, questions and answers. So please write down your questions. You can put them in the chat, but I can tell you that when we're presenting, we're not going to see the chat. So, um, so just keep hold on to them. So I'm Karen Bradley, and I'm going to talk about myself later. But I'm going to ask Cecilia Fontanisi to introduce herself and give a little bit of her background while I keep admitting people. Hi, hello. Um, my name is Cecilia Fontanesi. I am a dancer and I'm also a um, biologist who specialized in biology of behavior and neuroscience. Um, I, was, I am a CMA. I graduated from LIMS um, about 11 years ago. I am Italian, there where my accent comes from. And uh, I've been in New York since uh, 2010, studied at the Laban Institute. I got a PhD in uh, biology and neuroscience from CUNY, uh, City University of New York. And uh, I became a dance movement therapist um, with the American Dance Therapy Association um, about three years ago. I worked with people with neurodegeneration um, and um, dementia and Parkinson's. And I will pass my, but I'm also an aerial dancer. I'm a contact improviser. I teach partnering and do parkour, parkon, um, capoeira, aikido, hanging from trees, slacklining, flying kites. These are my passions. Um, Rebecca. Thank you, Chechi. Um, I'm Rebecca Barnstaple. I am coming to you from uh, Ontario, Canada. I'm uh, a couple hours north of Toronto on Georgian Bay. Um, and I have participated in the Global Water Dances previously as a choreographer, and I will again this year um, because I live close to the water and it's a part of my life. So I was really excited to be invited to be part of this. I also just finished my PhD in dance studies um, and specialized in uh, neuroscience uh, methods for looking at dance. 
and I'm still involved in doing that kind of research. Um, I also uh, provide dance therapy-based programs in community health contexts. I'm also working with neurodegenerative conditions. So I need to speak louder. Someone, can you guys hear me now? Is this better? I will project. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I also provide dance therapy based programs in community health and I'm still involved in uh, dance neuroscience research and the big passion of mine to um, offer translational learning opportunities to, uh, to, to those of us who dance and also understanding how neurological processes can, can maybe help us understand a different aspect of what it is to dance together. So I hope to share some of that with you today. Karen? Thank you. Thank you, Chechi and Rebecca. Um, I'm Karen Bradley. Um, I'm the president of the Laban Bartenieff Institute of Movement Studies. I'm on the steering committee for Global Water Dances. I was at um, Schumacher College when we had this crazy idea um, <laughs> to do this project. Um, I've done some research in neuroscience, particularly around identification of the EEG um, factors around effort, expressivity, um, and um, I don't know, what else? I wrote a book about Rudolf Laban, a bunch of other things. But I'm very excited about this because Chechi and Rebecca and I have been talking about this this uh, research that we've been talking about for months. And so we are very excited to launch our thinking about it. And this is just the beginning. I think we're gonna have to write about it, right? So if everybody's ready, let's get started. Okay, movement choirs and the collective effervescence of dance. A reminder to stay muted and to hold on to your questions. We begin with connection and a quote from the complexity of connection from the Stone Center's Jean Baker Miller Training Institute. We believe that human beings grow through and toward connection. The path of human development is through movement to increasingly differentiated and growth fostering connection. Collective effervescence this is an idea. Over the years, we've seen direct evidence, this is global water dances, of the shift that happens when people dance together specifically when we dance together to address a shared concern. And recent research and older research has attempted to unpack why and how this is so. And Emile Durkheim, the sociologist, identified this idea of collective effervescence, the means by which the social becomes internalized, which lies directly in the, very, in the experiences generated in the context of collective ritual. The very act of congregating is an exceptionally powerful stimulant. And once we gather together, a sort of electricity is generated from closeness, quickly launches us into an extraordinary height of exaltation. And here, I believe Ren is here, <laughs> but this is Prague, Czech Republic, Global Water Dances. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Rena. Communitas. Collective ritual, therefore, brings about a state of effervescence that alters the conditions of psychic activity. Along with Durkheim, Olav, Olavesen says, further points out, the anthropologist <coughs> Victor Turner asserted, communitas could develop through ritual, 
communitas refers to a state of equality, comradeship, and common humanity outside of normal social distinctions, roles, and hierarchies. It's a really important idea outside of normal social distinctions, roles, and hierarchies. Empathic engagement. Bonnie Meekums in 2012 described how dance movement therapy uses the idea of kinesthetic empathy to develop our attachments. And she quotes Shermer. The mirror is a useful metaphor. It's a metaphor when contemplating the immediacy with which we will react to each other's nonverbal communication. The embodied nature of empathic engagement is important, suggests, and he suggests that like the mirror's reflection, the social brain mind is in a constant dance with other brains. In his discussion of the discovery of mirror neurons, he observes that there's a motoric dimension to empathy, attunement, and attachment. That we are moved by another has a literal connotation. Or as Mary Lee Hardenberg puts it in our documentary, if everybody speaks at the same moment, it just creates bedlam. However, if everybody moves together at the same time, that can create a sense of closeness and community. People have a shared sense of purpose and empowered action. We are conspecifics. We are wired for such experiences to be meaningful. We are built for cooperation and for collective action. And Adolf cites Tumasello in their article on the social brain. The basic fact is thus that human beings are able to pool their cognitive resources in ways that other species are not. And this is made possible by a, very, by a single, very special form of social cognition, namely the ability of individual organisms to understand conspecifics as beings like themselves who have intentional and mental lives like our own. And when conspecifics synchronize to a broad range of stimuli, including interaction partners, much evidence has emerged that social synchronizing is not limited to motor processes, but includes the activity of the brain and other bodily systems, allowing dyads or groups of individuals to become something like a super organism. Each global water dance, therefore, has the potential to become a super organism, a force for shift to happen in the community. I want to add a little bit more and expand this idea of the force for a shift to happen in the community process of generating that force. So the first uh, slide that Karen showed you was by, uh, there was a quote by Jean Baker Miller, who was a psychiatrist, a psychoanalyst, social activist, a feminist author. Um, she was the first director of the Stone Center at Wellesley College. Her work brings together psychological thought with relational and cultural theory. In a book published in 2004, she describes how relationships in groups provide a potential for healing and empowerment. So here I listed something that may sound familiar, which comes from the book, The Complexity of Connection. Uh, in which she, together with the people that sh she works with, observes that people together experience a high level of energy. From that high level of energy, those who were stuck become empowered and unstuck. That in this process, they begin to understand, understand themselves and others, other members, more deeply and with more clarity, developing greater authenticity 
self-worth, and importantly, beyond the group in which they are, a desire for more connection with each other, but also outside the group. And you see some lovely images here that come from the film of Global Water Dances. And these are examples of groups. So you see the, the sense of coming together and the level of energy experienced with the group that Jean Baker Miller says carries over beyond the group. Um, Karen, next slide. In, the, in further examining this, these processes, and in particular within group dances, and how these groups dances support positive change, they support growth, they support health for individuals and community, Claire Schmeis, who was um, associate professor and coordinator of the dance therapy programs um, at Hunter College City University um, in the 80s, she takes into account the concept of healing factors, sometimes called curative factors, therapeutic factors. Let's call them healing factors for a moment. And here you have a few ideas that were previously, that have been previously um, formulated by verbal therapists, people who, who worked with both individuals and groups. So you can read acceptance, reality testing, transference, um, altruism, installation of hope. Um, I'm reading like I'm picking from words I see here, cohesiveness, um, existential factors, participation, and so forth. Next slide. I like the water image here because it's very existential. So here, Schmeis is um, coming down with eight factors that are particularly salient within group dances. Okay, and we'll talk for a moment about these um, synchrony rhythm, integration, symbolism, education, cohesion, expression, idealization. I would like to look at a short, very short clip with you for a moment from Global Water Dances. Looking at the words on the left, just wonder if you see any of this represented in the movement of this clip. Whether it's symbolism, whether it's cohesion, whether it's expression, looking at it for a moment for of the clip. Oh, that's very really helpful. Um, the work a day world. Movement choirs live on today and make up the third section of every global water dances event. So elements like symbolism, like cohesion, like expression, you might have seen some of those. What I want um, to say is that these processes are inherent to dance. So we experience these in group dances. They are also found in psychological theories. They may reveal, after all, something about who we are collectively, which also started to emerge in neuroscientific evidence in recent years. So now we're going to take a look about what we can say of these very processes inherent to dance through the lenses of cognitive science, neurobiology, and social neuroscience. Rebecca. Yes. Thank you, Chechi. Thank you, Karen. So I'm gonna start by talking, we're, we're gonna go down the list and we're gonna talk about each one of these eight healing factors. And we're gonna start with synchrony, which Karen already introduced in um, showing how this idea of collective effervescence is related to the idea of people moving together at the same time. So synchrony means simultaneous action or moving in time together. And it has been associated with um, increased cooperation, increased feelings of trust. And it's a really crucial aspect to what happens in global water dances, particularly this third part of the movement choir, where what we're aiming for is synchronized action. Um, Next slide, Karen. Uh, well, actually, I'll say something before because it has a video in it. Um, 
I also want to say that synchrony is a property of emergent systems, like it's an emergent property of complex systems. So synchrony is something that we can intentionally create, and it is also something that happens naturally uh, through physics, and I want to show a very quick video about that, and then we'll talk a little bit about how that relates to social neuroscience and how the brain works. Next slide, Karen. Okay, so this is this is synchronization. These are metronomes that are just going to be set off, and we're just this, we're just going to watch this for thirty seconds or so. Let's go on to the next slide. So synchronization is a really important aspect to how your brain works. So all of the time, your neurons are communicating through oscillatory activity. And the way that different brain regions communicate with each other is achieved through neural synchronization. This is one of the ways in which there's communication between different brain regions. Um, one of the ways we detect this is through EEG, which is um, electroencephalography, and Karen has done some work in that field before. I'm just gonna talk really briefly about an EEG study uh, that's pretty recent. This is from 2017, that is from the field of social neuroscience, because this is a hyperscanning study. So normally with EEG, what we're able to do is we're able to look at the electrical activity from the surface of the scalp for one person. And only very recently have we been able to look at what is happening between two people, conspecifics, as uh, they were previously referred to, to see what's happening between people's brains. Because we now know that there is a high degree of synchrony between different areas, and this is related to communication between areas. This is related to how we guide our attention. But what happens between people, and what is really fascinating, and I love about this study, is uh, this was a, a study with really trying to be ecologically valid. So it, instead of trying to control everything, this involved people who were having normal behavior. They were told to have a conversation. And they were instructed about the topic of the conversation, which was, uh, I believe, to plan a fun outing together. They had 104 subjects, which is pretty good. And they divided them into two groups. So they had 52 of each. So they had strangers that had never talked to each other before, ever. And they had couples who obviously had known each other. I think they set a threshold that you have to have known each other a number of years to participate in the study. And what you're looking at at the top are the heat maps of neural activity for these two groups of people. And if you look on the left, you can see for couples, these heat maps, which show different areas of neural activation, they look fairly similar. Whereas for strangers, there's there's a lot, it, it, there's a big difference. And if you look at the, um, the the chart down below, what it's showing that purple line is the degree of neural synchronization in the temporal area for couples, and it's extremely high. So this is really interesting. This is looking at gamma, which is like a a higher frequency of what you would pick up in the brain um, is related to attention. They also found that this was related to shared focus. So they, they also measured how often people looked at each other, how often people held their gaze, and they found that there was a high degree of correlation between the degree of neural synchronization that was observed and the amount of extended eye contact. So this was very interesting too, because it, uh, the, the, the previous slide that I showed you of the metronomes is showing an emergent property of synchronization between obviously inanimate objects, but there is a degree to which we can volitionally and intentionally create that synchrony. Um, and it could be related to moving together, sharing focus, sharing intention. Next slide, Karen. 
The synchrony is very linked to this other idea of rhythm, because rhythm is partly how we create synchrony. We need to have some sort of guiding force that helps us to know that we are able to move together and know that we are moving together. Um, there is uh, one of my favorite neuroscientists, Georgie Buzaki, has a book called Rhythms of the Brain. And you have several different frequencies happening that are primary frequencies that can be measured. And there's a really interesting process of entrainment that happens between these frequencies. Um, I'm gonna talk about that, but before I get back into the brain side of things, I want to show you another uh, short video that's about external entrainment with rhythm. So entrainment is about um, matching a beat and moving in time with the beat. So this is obviously not a human. This is, this is Snowball the Cockatoo, who is a big favorite of uh, music neuroscientists because he dances or we perceive him as dancing. And it's a good question to ask whether you think, you can ask yourself whether you think Snowball is actually dancing, but he has a number of moves. And in, in the last scientific article brought out about him, he has 14 moves that were charted. Um, but we're gonna hear some music. We're gonna see Snowball moving. And I also invite you at this point, it's like Sunday morning, if you need to wake up, you can like move along with Snowball and you can synchronize and entrain with him. I'm going to do it and I invite you to do the same. It's about a minute clip. So let's check out Snowball's moves. Okay. some great moves. I don't know if you were able to keep up with him, but you could see how he was in training with the beat. So his movements were following the beat of the, mu of the music. And it's an open question about the volitionality of that, because uh, obviously Snowball is a, a cockatoo. We cannot directly ask him what he thinks he's doing. But there are very few animals that we perceive as moving with a rhythm the way that we do as humans. So birds do. Um, I think there's been a little bit of research around elephants. Um, but some of our nearest uh, relatives, uh, like monkeys and, and chimpanzees, do not necessarily do this. It's harder to observe. So and this also has to do with how what we perceive we're seeing because we're, we're obviously inferring what is happening with Snowball. So one of the theories is that Snowball may not have any volition about this and maybe he cannot help but move to the beat. Something in his, the way his brain is put together and also birds obviously have a lot of um, relationship with, with, with music because bird song is very important to mating and communication for birds. Um, that last one was really interesting because they, they are beginning to propose that Snowball actually is experimenting some of the time because he's not always right on the beat. There are, there are moves that he has that are exactly synced with the beat. And then there are other movements that he has where he seems to take a bit longer. He's not exactly in training with the beat. And it's almost like he's doing a bit of movement exploration 
to explore the possibilities of his movement repertoire that he can then re-express with the music. So that last article is very interesting. If you want to look it up, you can go, you go look up Snowball's 14 Moves, and it's a short little piece, and it's got some interesting movement anal analysis in it. And they analyze the, the moments where he's in training and the moments where it seems like he may actually be being creative. So what's interesting about this is, like in, in human cultures, it's been observed for a very long time that rhythm is very important. Um, and rhythm can serve as a force of cohesion. It's also a force of communication. But how does it work that we feel a pulse? Um, and one of the theories about this has to do with the idea that there is actually a, like a, a neurological entrainment. So that the rhythms that are spontaneously happening in our brains, and I, I should have said this from the beginning with, with neural frequencies, your brain is always got electrical activity going on. It's not like it stops and starts. It's happening at many different frequencies all of the time. So this spontaneous background noise of the brain is organized through rhythm. One of the um, hypotheses about these is has to do with, is there a, a neural entrainment with external rhythms that allows us to feel the pulse of music? So it's not just an auditory signal that you hear the sound and then you start to sync up with it. So, so researchers here actually used syncopated rhythms. So there's a missing beat. Um, and they had a look to see what happens really from uh, like a, a neuron firing measure to see is there a measure of matching the beat? Like when the beat is gone, does the firing stop? Or does it continue? And the answer to this question was that it continues. So there is there was a feeling of the pulse within the brain. And that means that our background activity is capable of understanding uh, rhythm externally and continuing to produce it. So we're producing our feeling of rhythm internally and we do not necessarily need the auditory input. So this suggests that we have a we're really, really deeply wired to feel and understand rhythm. And that is part of the reason why it can be a driving force for organizing our social behaviors. Okay, next slide. Integration. I think it's you, Chechi. Integration. So a few words about this um, idea of integration. Um, integration could be uh, thought at an individual level and a, at a collective level. So next slide. Um, here I am offering um, a concept that comes from the work of Sabine Koch and uh, Thomas Fuchs at Heidelberg University in Germany. They work um, in the field of um, neuroscience, in action, dynamic system theory, uh, ecological approaches, um, developmental psychology. So you see that there are two parts of this um, of this graphics. One is person with the subject, and the other is art environment. So within the person, there are processes that have there are being studies that are. Um, processes of bodily resonance. So bodily resonance means that the subject or the person in an environment will sense through the, the senses about the external environment and the senses about the internal environment, interoception, will sense what's happening and form um, an image, like an internal image, a bodily feedback of what is um, happening for them. This image, this bodily resonance of the person is the motor that motivates movement. So movement is expression. If you follow the, the arrow at the bottom of this picture, the person from this internal state is going to move and express and the expression of each single individual, and in a movement choir, as you know, there's probably more than one, 
will inform and really create the reality of what we call the art environment, which is not just environment in the sense of uh, a physical space, but it's an environment of subject, actors, dancers, mover who express. So that creates the environment. That environment is going in return in this big loop to move each single individual. So here, the, each single individual again gets this bodily feedback that motivates their expression. So the person expresses, creates the art environment. The art environment is creating an impression, expression, impression to move, to be moved. And that is the contribution of each individual to the art environment. I have a clip from Global Water Dances where I would like to see if we can get that sense of community coming together and individuals expressing and then being impressed in return. <laughs> nos llevó a conocer a otros hermanos de las otras comunidades como Kawasi y Cañales, pueblos originarios que también tienen otras luchas, luchas que nos corresponden y a las que nos sumamos, porque ellos defienden el agua que nosotros posteriormente tomamos, defendiéndolos de las mineras. De esta forma hemos tenido que articular organizaciones, tanto de base local como organizaciones regionales, como las rondas campesinas, así como organizaciones femeninas como la Marcha Mundial de las Mujeres. So this integration um, of individuals, children, community in the art action, um, creates a change, which is the integration of individuals in this collective creates a shift in what they call in this model, uh, Fuchs and uh, Koch, they call the aesthetic or affordances. So what changes is what we think is possible in a certain environment. What we think is possible in a certain environment through the art action. Okay, um, moving forward, I want to spend a few words. Of symbolism, we're going to the juicy things. So symbolism, um, here I want to bring um, an example from the Barbara Tversky, who is a um, she teaches cognitive psychology and um, she focuses on visual spatial reasoning, collaborative cognition at, at Stanford University, Columbia University. Next slide. So this is what she says in her latest book, um, Mind in Motion, How Action Shapes Thought. The world is a diagram in which we see that our actions in, in space design the world, that the design create abstract patterns that attract the eye and inform the mind, that the actions get abstracted to gestures that act on thought, and that the patterns to diagram that convey thought. Actions in space create abstraction symbols, meaning. So let's look at this clip from Global Water Dances. And what I'm going to ask you is that you look at this clip, thinking about the symbolism, these diagrams that are forming with the movement in space. <laughs> At this time, we need to pray for the health of our environment, in particular, the water, the life, culture, and strength of the Mi'kmaq people cannot be separated from the water. We embrace our connection to the lifeblood of Mother Earth and encourage all people to remember that water is sacred and it is our responsibility to protect the water. The piece is loosely, very loosely titled, The River That Works. 
so often when we think about water, I think often the images that come to mind are of our blue crystal waters with beaches, you know, going off to the Caribbean. But if you look at the Shubenacadie River, the Shubenacadie River is, it's, it's a brown river. It's an earthy river. And when I look at it, I think that this is a river that, that works. This is a river that toils. So in this last gesture, you might have seen actions in space create abstraction. So Barbara Tversky in the book Mind in Motion is really exploring from a neuroscience perspective the way in which um, our brains encode spatial relationships. And on these spatial relationship map, we also can map abstract concept. So the, the complexity of movement in space is related to the complexity of our ability to handle abstract thinking. So this is what, where she's getting to at. Symbolism. And to this, Rebecca. Yeah, I'm going to add something. Thank you, Chechi. Um, what we're really trying to, to tie together in this talk are, are three bodies of knowledge. So um, we started in looking at the body of knowledge, which is dance-based knowledge, which is really, really central to the work that we're all involved in. Um, we have this aspect of, of healing knowledge, thinking about healing factors and how that integrates with dance-based knowledge and informs it, also how dance-based knowledge can inform these healing factors. And then we're also bringing in neuroscience, which is more to do with biological mechanisms and processes that occur you know, subconsciously, but are part of how we create and understand our reality. So we're trying to weave these three things together. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. Um, I just wanted to say something to bring that information back to dance, which is this, that dance is fundamentally ontological, which means it is about being. It is about, it is not knowledge, uh, it, it is the creation of that knowledge and the being of that knowledge. And when we engage in movement together, we are creating a world, we are speaking to the world that we currently inhabit, and sometimes we are transforming that world. This is the power of dance. So if we think about dance as a form of movement that is specific and different to something that we might refer to as quotidian or habitual movement or exercise. Dance is not about the what, it's about the how. How is that movement accomplished? It is the way that we move. So this, this aspect of the efforts that come into a movement choir, the quality of the movement, imagery, metaphor, the idea that movement has meaning, so this symbolic aspect, and the poetics of the movement, so the, uh, the ability to connect shapes in space or our organization as a group with abstraction and something that can be shared. And a lot of this has to do also with our cultural dances and our cultural background because dance is like a cultural ontology and it, that it responds to and describes the worlds we inhabit and it alters the way we experience these worlds. And something that is so phenomenal and interesting about global water dances is the sharing of diverse cultural ontologies. And in that example that Cecilia just showed, we actually see a coming together of different movement ontologies uh, from the Mi'kmaq people. And then we see more of a contemporary dance intersecting and moving together. And I think this is a really beautiful aspect uh, of this work. Next slide. Okay, education. So global water dances, the participants also learn as they teach as well. So what do people learn by participating in global water dances? Well, they learn some facts, which you're going to hear about here. 40 million pounds of trash get thrown into this river every year. Los de Motupe, los, los sectores rurales, utilizan el agua del subsuelo. No tenemos agua potable. 
eso nos llevó a pensar y descubrir de dónde viene el agua que usamos. Y esa agua venía de la serranía de Tapayacán. So that clip is about what people learned in Peru about the water source that they had. And the first part of it is about what people learned about at the Anacostia River from the sharing by Gretchen Dunn. How do people feel about water? What is the social emotional learning that goes along with global water dances? Has anyone ever been in love? I invite us today to fall in love with water. Without no water, there's no life. It's that spirit of wild abandon that may have begun at Ascona that has grown into a worldwide celebration. It's a glorious dream, but one that acknowledges, as the poet Yeats once wrote, that in dreams begin responsibility. It's not enough to dream, we have to act. And through global water dances, we take the first steps by dancing. We watch trained dancers moving, and we in the audience start to move, too. And how to act. To dance like this is to learn how to act, not just by creating awareness of local ecological problems, but by tapping into that power within us, both physical and spiritual, to change, to grow, to create a better world, not just for ourselves, but for our children, who join in the global water dance too, and continue it into a better and brighter future. Global water dances doesn't fix the water problems. It helps us all to see what is there to be seen. And we see it together. We can then all face the challenges together. Sorry, this just has to go through this for some reason. To dance like. Cohesion. Being a part of the dance by sharing and repeating simple steps and rhythms builds a sense of community. It is not until people actively participate in each other's symbolic statements that group cohesiveness takes root. According to Merton, cohesiveness results from the scope and intensity of the members involvement. Claire Schmeis. For me, uh, dance is a universal language. You don't have to speak any language to understand what it's about. And I think what this youth center did very well is to tell a story about uh, the issues in the community through movement and through dance. Without saying one word, they still have a way to express themselves. The event was rich and diverse. It included mostly young people using different styles of dance, and they actually made the dance about teaching people to boil their water before drinking it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> 
Expression. Sorry, I'm muted. <laughs> we're going to we're going to, we're going to shift from here to expression and and back to uh, there's something I want to share about this idea of expression. We've been talking a lot about um, synchronized movements, moving together, moving together as a coherent group, and this idea of collective effervescence. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about in relation to expression is specifically for this part three, the, the movement choir, we have a shared motor vocabulary where, where we're aiming to create the same movements at the same time. And what is the role of expression within that? Um, so I'm gonna give a little example to get to what I want to say. Karen, can you skip to the next slide, please? So I, I recently did a study in Berlin with um, mobile EEG, and I was interested in looking at how we learn a motor sequence. And one aspect of this was teaching people a brief 30-second choreography that everyone learned the same 30-second movement vocabulary. And uh, once they learned it, they performed it six times. What was really interesting is that some of the research I was, I was working with were going more from a, a scientific motor learning perspective. And their idea was that over time, people would become more adept at replicating a perfect model. So I, if I was teaching them the choreography, that would be the perfect model and that the goal was to perfectly replicate it. And we were doing motion tracking as well as EEG. I didn't think that would happen, and, and I was right. What was very interesting about this is that over time, after each um, instance of, of performing this dance, this little 30-second choreography, I asked participants to what extent they felt like they were fully dancing, and the responses always increased over time. So they, you know, maybe after the first one, they felt like 40%. By the last one, most people felt like 80, 90, 100%, they felt like they were fully dancing. And what's interesting, you can kind of see in these images on the left, at the end, I asked people, you know, create one of the movements that you remember from this choreography. And so these three people chose the same moment, but you can see they're doing it kind of differently. They've put themselves into it. And I think what's really interesting is even in shared movement vocabulary, we are always putting ourselves into it. There's this idea that when we feel like we are fully dancing, it has something more to do with the idea of inhabiting the movement and finding meaning in it. So this was like a freely chosen moment in the dance. They could have picked anything. They all picked this one. This was something that had some meaning for them. And you can see that there's this relationship between motor expression, inhabiting the movement, and creating meaning. And when we do that together in a movement choir, we have this coming together of the idea of synchrony, rhythm, moving together in the same way, in the same direction, and yet we still bring ourselves into it. The fact that it has meaning for us is conveyed in the subtle differences in which we share this movement. Um, I think that's the main thing I wanted to say. The, 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 the images on the left, I've just started analyzing the data, but these are clusters or areas where there were shared activations in the brain, and you can see, you know, we cluster together, but we're not all in the same spot. We gather. Next slide. May I, uh, may I add one thing, um, Karen, sure. if you go back for a second, because um, Rebecca and I shared this interest uh, in the question, how is dance different than other forms of movement and the expression piece, right? Um, so Rebecca is running this experiment and she's analyzing this data. And um, I did a similar thing with um, people with Parkinson's that are engaged in dance for Parkinson's classes. And I compared what it is for them to take part in a dance for Parkinson's session versus another form of movement, which uh, does not stem from um, perspective of artistic expression. And um, I looked at their sense of uh, beauty and agency in these two um, different scenarios. So this, um, this question of expression, which was also core to Laban's work, it's paramount. 
And uh, next slide, vitalization. Wait, wait, I want to say something too about expression. Um, Lots to say about expression. Lots to say, which is in the in the effort study that I did, we worked with um, five um, fairly um, mature CMAs and each one approached the same effort quality through different means as well. So there were different parts of the brain activated for e reaching each, each quality. So very interesting. Vitalization, Chachi. So we are landing on our last, uh, it's a big one. It's a big idea, vitalization, an enhanced feeling of being alive. Right, so an enhanced experience of being alive. So, um, if we move to the next slide, what um, I think there's there are a couple of things that came up uh, in recent years. Initially, from um, with uh, Damasio, who was talking and writing, and his work was about the nature of feeling, this emergence of self from bodily sensation, and more recently in the work of Lisa Feldman Barrett, um, who is really creating a structure of uh, what are emotions, what are feeling, and how are they, how do they stem from physical sensation, and uh, how diverse they are. How cannot we reduce ever uh, feel, uh, emotion to a set range of uh, words, for example. I love this quote because we were talking about uh, global water dances. Your river of feeling might, might feel like it's flowing over you, but actually you're the river's source. And I like the idea that um, vitality is something that we can express in the world, in the space around us as well as a property of our internal landscape. So let's look at the clip for a moment. It's very short, a few seconds. I think dance changes things, like where dance has been changes spaces. So a space is changed by having dance and people move in. A space is changed, is changed by all dances. And this is the space around us and the space inside us. And if you look at the, to the left of this uh, slide, you see the changes of the landscape inside of the interoception. I wanna read uh, you a very, very brief quote from uh, Lisa Feldman Barrett book. Interoception is your brain's representation of all sensations from your internal organs and tissues, the hormones in your blood, your immune system. Think about what's happening within your body right this second. Your insides are in motion. So when we activate that, our insides are in motion more so when we move. So we increase that sense of the sense of being alive, the sense of vitality, the, all the information we have about this internal landscape and the space around us. Next slide, which brings us from this kind of bodily perspective, expanding to the environment, to our actions and the extension of our actions beyond ourselves. I think we all wanted to, to contribute a, a little idea to this. And then from here, we're going to open out into a conversation. So this is, this is where we're, we're, we're going to talk with each other a little bit, maybe. But we really invite you to, you know, if you've been thinking about questions, you can throw them in the chat or get ready to throw them at us. Um, but one of the things we've been circling around in this discussion has been about what makes something a dance. What is special about dance? And specifically, what is special about moving together? And I think there's a couple of really important things if we look at this first link between body and environment. Dance is really central to promoting a sense of agency because dance is volitional movement. Dance is not something where we are, we are trying to achieve a specific goal. We're not trying to throw a ball in a net 
We're not trying to push a button. We're not trying to get somewhere. It's volitional movement, this movement we choose to make. And in making that movement, we observe ourselves in making that movement, and that in turn feeds our sense of agency. Or to go back to um, some of Hawkins Brooks's work that um, Cecilia was talking about earlier, this, um, this sense of activating the affordances of our environment around us and also the affordances of our own bodies. What is it possible for my body to do? How does my body engage with the environment? And what comes out of that interaction? Um, and when we think about the idea of moving together collectively, as uh, Karen finished off with, with their slides at the introduction, is that we have this sense of a shared body. We have the sense of a larger body than just our own body that has a larger sense of agency and volition in extending its actions within and through that environment. And I just want to jump in here with a little bit of the historic and political as well, because it's not mass movement. It's not that we're subsuming our own patterns to the larger one completely, we are contributing, each of us, to the whole. So that organism that we're talking about that can foster change includes each individual's voice as well. And that's critically important to understand. I like that image of the ripple effect of the drop in the water and how that resembles the geometry the geometry of the dancers you see in the global water dances picture underneath and now for conversation so i'm going to stop the share and we're going to open it up and I see there's things in the chat. <laughs> okay. We've got questions in the chat. So let's see. I remember watching a doc about a professional dancer who was deaf. She could feel the rhythm in the air. Yes. Victoria, it is so great to hear that science has researched what I, as a hand drummer, have experienced in my body. Tara, the embryo grows, unfolds with a response to two beats, the beating heart of the embryo and the beating heart of the mother. That's a great, great point that there's two that are happening. I, I see someone asked me to write something in the chat. Um, I think that was when we were talking about ontology and, and we are working on writing um, a paper about all of this stuff we just talked about. So. Maybe we'll, maybe we'll light the fire and get that done a, a little faster, but also you will have access to this recording. Yes, you will. And I made two comments about the comments on the chat, um, the one you just read, um, the, the feeling of the rhythm in the air that kind of, I, I think what, what um, Anna means is a tactile sensation of pressure. And it's exactly our sense of hearing. It's a form of tactile sensation in the ear and uh, we, we feel the variations in pressure that sound, right? So it's amazing how we could transfer that to skin and not just the membrane inside our ear. That's, that's, that's beautiful. Um, the sensitivity of our skin can perceive that variation impression, which is sound. And the other thing about the heartbeat, I don't know if you know, but when pregnant women are in a pool with, with dolphins, and dolphins are mammals, and they also have their own children in their bodies, they are very attracted to um, pregnant women because they they can hear the two heartbeats of the of the pregnant mammal, and they recognize it as a pregnant mammal. Mm. So dolphins can recognize women in, in a body of water when they carry a child. Very cool. I, I, wanted, I wanted to add something to the first thing that you said, Chechi, about um, this feeling is tactile, because the, I think that was in response to one of the um, papers I was sharing about uh, feeling the pulse of the beat. And what that, the premise of that was really exploring is this sensory motor loop that is created in dance. Like, how do we translate what we sense? 
which often with rhythm is auditory, but yes, it could be tactile, it could be transmitted through a pulse. How do we translate that into a motor expression? And how does that link persist? When I was in um, this, when I was in the DC area, we had uh, a chapter, used to have chapters in the Sacred Dance Guild. And we went to, um, we had the, the women who formed a group from the, the um, College of the Deaf and they had to have the music really loud because they felt it. And some people were turned off by this, but it was necessary for some of the more severely deaf people in that situation. There's a question in the chat from Deirdre Dwyer. Have you studied children's brains to see their brains plasticity and fluid expressionism? I have not specifically studied children's brains in that way. It's a, it's a good question. I mean, there are some really nice studies in the last couple of years that are about brain plasticity. Um, I'm a big fan of Mueller and Rehfeld's work in Germany, but there's definitely been uh, studies mainly with older adults looking at brain plasticity and key markers like BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, showing that they're has been a creation of um, new synaptic connections in the brain. There's like changes in white matter and gray matter that have been observed. So there's definitely emerging research on brain plasticity. It is difficult to do research on brain plasticity and our tools are only now sort of being able to, to look at that. And we're still a lot of the time inferring from things like fMRI where we have you know, some information and we're trying to say or to understand what is happening and correlate it with things behaviorally like learning. I also wanted to say, someone um, asked a question a second ago about, um, to me that said, you stated three things, healing, knowledge, neuroscience, and what was the first thing? I think I know what they're talking about. I and did you. The, the, the first thing is dance. <laughs> dance knowledge. So, well, we were, yeah, what we were saying is that the, this three body of knowledge that we were trying to maybe bring together is really what we know by dance, through dancing, in dancing, and what we know, what, what people know in the field of psychology and um, uh, psychotherapy, and what is emerging in the field of neuroscience. These are maybe three fields, but they, are, they point at similar um, things sometimes, or they, they find common ground. That was what we were trying to get to. Um, to the brain plasticity of children, um, I maybe want to say, just to make sure that we are um, clear on that, that brain plasticity is a property of our brains that we have throughout our lives. That we are, brain plasticity just means that our brain is not a static um, structure. So it's not a hardware, so to speak, in the metaphors, hardware, software, mind, brain. Mm -mm. So a hardware is a thing that is made of metal and chips. That's not the human brain, which is made of meat. So it's made of cells and a lot of water. <laughs> so it changes over time, right? So we call that plasticity, the ability to change because it's alive. It's, a, it's an organ. So that the capacity or the extent as to which there you can observe changes may vary with age, but also will vary on how many connections you have. And when we are born, we have to form a lot of connections. We have to learn pretty much anything and everything. So children, uh, I don't know if this idea of fluid means that there, there are a lot to, of connections to form. And so maybe some of the things we do or enact seem more surprising or different or fluid, we could use that word. Um, but it may depend on the fact that we are still like absorbing a lot of information from our environments, right? I want to add something to that, Chechi, which is that in, in children, especially very young children, the main thing that's happening is synaptic pruning. So rather than creating new connections, there's actually over connections, there's an overabundance of connections. 
and through learning how to control the body, how to move through space, we're actually making the system more efficient. And there's a pruning of connections, which is why a lot of the synaptic um, plasticity and the neuroplasticity work has happened with older adults. So pruning, pruning is a technical term that just means that when we form connections, not all connections survive. And this often happens when we sleep. Some connections that are maybe less important are let go. <laughs> so that's the process of learning. You know, when you study and then the day after you, you have a sense of more clarity of what you studied the day before. So there's a biological, physiological process of sort of clearing some of the connections that may be less um, helpful or useful or relevant. Pruning, like, we, what, like uh, with the trees. And I'll add that my, my certification project was with seven learning disabled, what it was said at the time, learning disabled children and playing with the additional patterns from Bartenia fundamentals allowed them to do some pruning and some reorganizing. And so it was really plasticity in action to see what happened to uh, not only their, their movement lives, but their behaviors and their reading skills and so on as we worked on things like contralaterality, access to organization in space, had tail connection, sequencing, all of those things. And all seven of these kids changed their patterns, improved their reading through this particular project that I did, um, but each did it differently. They started off with completely different ways of organizing their worlds and their bodies. So, yeah, great. In Reggio Emilia, yeah. 99 of them are gone. Yes, Reggio Emilia. I just wrote about that. <laughs> Karen, do you want to read a little bit above? There's a yeah something. Um... Uh, Natasha's. Yep. Is that one about rhythm not being dependent on the auditory it makes me think about effort phrasing, how it's important to understand that rhythm is not equal to music how rhythm is related to movement, how the beginning of life is related to the heartbeat. Beautiful, yeah. Thanks, Natasha. I don't know, so uh, the Reggio Emilia, um, so I'm from Italy, I was born maybe 30 minutes from Reggio Emilia. I am not really sure about what that means. And I know a lot about Reggio Emilia because I grew up with, uh, um, the um, a book which every Italian kid uh, reads, which is called Fiabe al Telefono by Gianni Rodari, that's the author. So Gianni Rodari is one of the people who influenced the thought of the Reggio Emilia pedagogical schools for like young children. Um, I'm not sure about the, that you're born with a hundred languages and you lose them, but what I can tell you is that um, Gianni Rodari, and it, this has to do with movement choirs, and uh, I promise. Gianni Rodari was an anti-fascist, and Gianni Rodari um, was very interested in language, and he was very interested in um, giving children ownership of their language. And working with not just the words that we that have meaning, but also words that we can, new words that emerge from a sound composition and how maybe words don't, don't, do not only relate to each other because of meaning, but also because of their assonance or dissonance in sound and how that can become the source for imagination and creation of association between things that otherwise we wouldn't put together. So he has a whole pedagogical approach, which is, it's called, there's a book called The Grammar of Fantasy, which I recommend, The Grammar of Fantasy, Gianni Rodari. And this for him was the tool to create anti-fascist spirits. It's a form of resistance to, um, 
oppression and dominance. Can you write Don Johnny's name in the chat? Sure. And that's so interesting because I just invoked Reggio Emilia in a report that I wrote because we're having an, a community level conversation about the placement of a new school. And I was using the idea of Reggio Emilia and what happened there, the anti-fascist idea particularly um, about why these, these kinds of um, these institutions, when they happen in community, it's so much richer because there's so much more input, there's so many more opportunities and so on, rather than in an enclosed um, space that you know, we often think of the school as being in lockdown or, you know, surrounded by, or even in, in some cases, held by guards, you know, there's security, security that the students have to go through. The difference between that kind of a school and a school where the kids wander out into the community and, you know, learn how to bake bread from the baker and, you know, so on and so forth. So, yeah, it's a city in the, the not too far from where Chechi grew up, right? in Italy. And it's an educational approach as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other questions or thoughts, you can unmute, you can put them in the chat. Yes, it takes a village, but a real village, a village, you know, not where people are locked in their houses all the time, right? I also wanted to just take a moment and say thank you and goodbye to the people that are saying they need to leave now. We really thank you for spending some time on, well, here at Sunday morning, whatever it is for you, spend some time together. And like we still have some moments to spend if you do want to have uh, any questions or things you want to share. Rebecca, this is Victoria Day from Columbia, Missouri. I have a question. Yeah. Okay, so. I love coming to these events. I love being excited and resonating with all of you who love this. How I have her, I live in a community where I find it difficult to connect. I mean, I live in a community where like I don't talk about myself as a dancer because I learned that people would not come to my movement events because they thought I was going to ask them to dance. Right. There's like, and, and so I feel like, um, you know, I get really full and, and I vibrate with this, but then I'm, I, I'm, I'm seeking a way, like, is there any way that you, the three of you who pulled this together can give me the appetizer version? Right, like I'm able to come in here and eat this eight course meal with you and drink and be merry. However, I haven't quite figured out how to offer it as an appetizer to start building in a community where, I mean, for me, getting three people to join with me is, is thrilling. However, I do yearn for more. Yeah, I hear you, Victoria. <laughs> <laughs> and Judy's waving and Judy and I are going to connect because we're actually geographically close, only a couple of hours. So, oh, okay. yeah, because yeah. I'm in <laughs> Colombia, so we're, we're only a couple hours away from each other. That's great. And that is how it happens, right? Mm -hmm. So there are some of my community members here and also some people here who've been participating in a bi-weekly dance class that I teach online called Just Dance. And it's, you know, the opportunities of um, taking this work into actual practice has been fascinating and important. Um, and of course there are, you know, we're, we're, we're weird in the community I'm weird, you know, but I think that, you know, it's sort of a lather, rinse, repeat kind of process, you know, you just keep at it 
and it does trickle out, out, right? And so people become interested because it's, you know, there it's like the water. It's like that ripple that where the stone was dropping in. The ripples go out and people recognize that there's a ripple going by and maybe they're missing it. So um, I don't know any other way to do this. The ripple idea, I think, is it. Chachi, Rebecca, what were you going to say? Yeah, I think it's a lovely uh, image. You know, you drop the, the stone in the pond and you don't you don't know where the how far the ripples are going to go or when they're going to reach the shore. Um, I will say, Victoria, I, I also live, I live in a very small rural community where many people uh, do not identify as dancers. And it's surprising where where people connect with this work and where allies or interested people may come from. So um, there's also a, a really big indigenous community where I live for whom dance is a part of life. Um, and uh, people from that community approached me to work together on this because they felt a resonance with it. Like you, you don't know where it's going. And I had another group of people approach me that really connected with the political aspect. They also said, we don't dance, we don't know how to dance, but we have a really big water issue. And this looks like a great way to, to, to share that issue in a different format with people and to bring some different attention to this this um, this issue that we're dealing with. So I, I think also providing maybe maybe not just one stone. I'd say like drop a bunch of stones because you don't know where they're going to land. Um, mm -hmm. And also the appetizer version. This this idea that we we are made to move. Like snowball started grooving to that <laughs> beat, and, and so do we. And sometimes I find like music is such a great unifier, bringing that coherent force, whether it's through sound, whether it's through seeing, even just seeing your three people moving together could be very evocative for people. Mm -hmm. And you don't know where that's going to land. So so I, I say like, throw a bunch of stones, see mm -hmm. where the ripples go. And I, I hope people will join you. I'm sure they will. I'm going to ask D Dee, Dee if you want to unmute and just say something about this, because you've been part of this from the beginning, but Dee's not a dancer. Hi. Yes, I'm not a dancer, I'm a poet. Um, and we had the first water global water dance that I participated in, we walked with a small group of people from an old aquifer site towards a, a small stage in the village center. Our village is very small, but it's spread out geographically. There were only a few participants in the dance, maybe five or six, Karen maybe, and but we had a small audience um and then we did it again a couple of years ago at karen's studio and it wasn't in the village center but we danced outside on a beautiful spring day and it was lovely and i think more people would be interested in it in again if we did it when we do it again when we do it again um because i think Karen's knowledge and expertise is growing in this community. Everybody knows that she's a wonderful woman and full of great ideas and full of great actions. Some people know. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to step out. You're going to, you know, you drop the stones in the ripples. Some of those ripples come back at you as, you know, waves meant to drown you. So just, <laughs> you just have to be prepared for that. Okay. Amen. It's not personal though, right? It's not personal. It's their stuff, right? Chachi, what are you going to say? I was going to say that um, I'm reading the chat and this idea of um, the barrier, maybe, Victoria, if I understand that correctly, that sometimes the word dance could constitute, constitute for people. Um, in my experience, I um, um, I, I, I approach this a little bit as dance is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> so that's my approach. So for me, I, if I had a bucket of water and I poured water, 
um, that was dancing. And, and that, because there, there's a sense of emer an emergence of beauty and meaning that we could tap into eventually. And it's like, you know, you're offering this, um, this I, I, I love physical theater, um, all kinds of strange, I did harness and ropes walking on buildings those kind of things. And that's not like maybe what, what considered traditionally as, as, as dance, but um, you know, climbing is dancing. So there's a lot of kind of um, um, actions that are, can be viewed or experienced as gestures or maybe inspire some meaning or symbol that transcends uh, those, even when they are really quotidian <laughs> things like pouring water from a bucket. Um, so I think that um, I more often than not, thinking about the idea of the hundred languages we we're born with and then we lose them kind of idea, I think that our work serves could be a bridge toward something that a lot of people have been, that, that they have lost, uh, which is the, the, the connection to movement. And I think it's like, um, uh, it's, it's our birthright and it's being taken away from us because of circumstances of life and living. And so, whatever little bridge or opening we can we can offer in whatever shape or form that's what i my understanding of this yeah well, uh, can we, i speak uh, to that too oh barbara do you want to go ahead yeah i was just wondering has anybody interviewed people this regular people who have been been involved in the in the water dancing a couple months later to see what their feelings about the experience were and if they're if they had changed any ideas about the importance of water oh yeah. yes there's um something called our site impact fund project and vanya or natasha would you like to jump in here and talk about that <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, I have another thought about what Victoria was saying. I will, you know, but I will, yeah, <laughs> hold there. Uh, and yes, about the site impact fund is something that um, that we are creating. We have started in 2019, and what we are doing is kind of inviting people to collaborate, both from the um, from the artistic side and also from the environmental side. So uh, they can actually share what dance, um, why dance is important and also why the environmental part is important. And then um, we do a follow-up after the collaboration is done. So in that way, we can see if that actually had an impact or not. So the idea is to actually create synergy and that, go, that goes back to what Victoria was saying. I think the best, the, my best times doing a global water dance were when I actually found other people who were also able to bring their people, <laughs> you okay. know? So what Rebecca was saying and what Chichi was saying too, like, um, yes, you don't need to do it alone by yourself. So what is better for me is like creating this kind of, um, that you are on not only one stone on that ripple, but actually you have many others. Yes, so those ripples are intersecting you know, and that can be people from, yes, and creating this kind of a splash. If you are only one, yes, you can expect like that ripple will go and sometimes, you know, reach somebody. But if you have many of them, you create a whole dance. <laughs> so I think, um, I know that sometimes it's difficult, especially right now, but find, yes, finding somebody else who also have that, you know, kind of, yes, I want to also either, you know, dance or, Maybe I, I'm more into the um, political or activism or environmental, and they have also, you know, another community. So finding different communities that can intersect. And then from them, 
maybe not all of them, like maybe, you know, a dance studio or some, something like that. Uh, maybe not all of them are going to be, you know, connected, but at least you have planted the seeds. So um, what happened to me in the first Global Water Dances in 2011 is that I, I had some friends who had the studios that were, or I had a friend who was doing, uh, actually work with um, uh, um, moms-to-be, like they were, uh, you know, and she was doing this beautiful work of dance and um, uh, for moms to be and that was amazing she did something so it was like a synergy um, and it wasn't only about me so that's what I wanted to offer well Sibela can you want to say something about the slight impact fund and your project in Brazil in terms of impact no yes no can you? Yeah, we hear you. Yeah, okay. Uh, so let me try to speak English. <laughs> it's a long time I don't practice, but yes, we uh, have nice experiences with this uh, impact because we had people saying that they never thought about uh, where the water comes from or something like that and uh, the responsibility for, uh, of them uh, with this. So we shared lots of uh, good impression about this in terms of audience and people who were dancing with us changed their uh, um, daily uh, relation with water. So we are now experiencing a more deep uh, relation to water in terms of knowing that we are water and that we, uh, how do we deal with all these uh, little rain uh, bath and drinking water? How does it impact, how, how it impacts uh, ourselves? And that's been a very nice experience, yes. Although we don't have that much audience as we would like, uh, it is still a lot for us here in Porto Alegre. Okay. So Natasha, did you want to say something? You got I, have to so, I have so much to say, but it's not appropriate. <laughs> I will just say the idea that just came into my head listening to Sibylla's comment. Little audiences everywhere add up to a world. We're talking thousands of people impacted by movement choirs and global water dances. I have felt it too. Why so little? participants why such a small audience all i have to do though is look at the map on the global water dances website mm -hmm. and look at the compilation videos that vanya edits and look at the documentary that we put out a month ago and i understand that i am a part of not just as this is what vanya said it's more than a ripple it's a ripple across the world. So we are a part of an experience and a project that is worldwide, that is impactful. And every little thing that we do, as long as we do it with intention, is meaningful, important. And that's why it's so important for us to gather. Thank goodness for Zoom. Thank goodness for technology. Mm -hmm. Let's oh, use yes. this superpower and this technology for good. Thank goodness for this so that we can come together and remind each other we are part of a global movement, a global movement for movement for water. Little everywhere equals big somewhere. Somewhere. <laughs> yes, 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 and yes. You know, I think that a lot of times, um, and I've, from a political perspective, you know, we have to think about scaling up. Like it's gotta, you know, it's gotta be viral. And there's different ways to think about scaling, right? If we don't need a million people by a water area, 
in order to have the impact that we want to have. But, you know, 200 sites, which is what we're hoping for this year, 200 sites around the world, some of them with one person, some of them with 40 people, that is scaling. That's a different kind of scaling. And it's scaling out, again, the ripple idea. Um, and ripples go both ways, right? They, they, they go both no, ways. They don't. <laughs> so, you know. Um, yeah. So I think it's really important, uh, you know, even from a political perspective, it, it is, you know, we, we hear all the, you know, we hear all the time about, you know, that the Laban movement choirs were fascistic and everybody had to do the same thing at the same time. And that's not true. Right. They were, you know, these small performances, in some cases, larger performances, but everybody brought their own voice to the to the table. And that's why it got that's what got them in trouble. Right? <laughs> They got in trouble mm -hmm. with it. And I think that's, that's a message that we need to all understand is that every voice does count and every voice has the potential to make a difference. All in the voices world. matter. So. My very um, first um, yeah. time that I did this, I was the only dancer. It was, it, it was a catastrophic thing that happened that the one group that I was depending on wasn't able to be there. So it was me and my singer. <laughs> and I had, I don't know, maybe a small audience. My second time, I had six people and no audience. <laughs> so it changes um, as you go along. And I don't know, this year I was thinking, and I don't know whether we're doing this virtually or what we're doing this year, but I had thought of pulling back and just doing it in the yard of the church with a fountain that I ha happened to own that <laughs> then I can use a little fountain and attract whoever shows up and whoever doesn't. And also I was thinking of bringing in people who understand how to keep water clean. One of our issues around here has to do with leaves and grass clippings in the gutters. And you'd be surprised, well, you probably wouldn't be surprised at how much of that stuff is going on. So that's my two cents. <laughs> Judy. Um... <laughs> I'm not sure what community you're in. I live in a smaller community too, but this is a kind of a comment for everyone. Um, so maybe when you do your water dance in front of the church, maybe do it on Sunday morning as people are entering the church. And then you have this incidental audience of passerbys that are just going into church already, and then they become your audience. We uh, did a global, well, we did a, a water dance uh, uh, on the steps of the Performing Arts Center when people were entering the symphony because we knew tons of people go to the symphony. And so they incidentally had to pass by us as they were entering to go into the symphony. And so we kind of used the symphony audience as our own. Um, so they were a non-intended audience, but um, it was a way to get people to see what we were doing. That actually may work. My church is so small that they all know about it. I've talked about it enough, but my church is so small. We'd have maybe 10 people tops that would walk by. <laughs> so the symphony might be a better plan. <laughs> There's so much going on in the chat as well. Um, oh, okay. Um, I also, yes, my grandmother's hand. Yes. It's yeah. a, um, we've also been reading cast um, to really address the idea of, you know, stratification, hierarchies, and so on. All of these things have made their way into these conversations um, as we were, as the three of us were preparing this presentation. The conversation has been so far ranging. Um, so, yeah, Christina, you had something that you wrote in here that Natasha said she's interested in hearing more about. Are you still here, Christina? This is huge. Christina? Christina, me? Yeah, you. Hi. 
<laughs> Sorry, it's a bit complicated here. I cannot like uh, have my uh, video on. Um, yeah, no, I was thinking of the like the conversation that uh, we had together like the other day again, like with regard to what types of uh, realities does the body in the act of moving collectively create? And if like, I don't want to romanticize anything, but like, um, Tetsi and uh, Rebecca, uh, like, do, how can that be answered from a neuroscience perspective? Like, how can the body, the collective moving body, desire creating worlds of uh, equity without, like, really not desiring uh, binaries, coping, coping up with the environment different from that space of, like, interdependence and interrationality without tearing things you know i was just wondering if like we have uh, i christina i was reading your your question and i'm happy that natasha also picked it up so um and i would love to continue the conversation with you <laughs> so <laughs> this is what i can tell you right now that comes to mind so there's a um, Francisco Varela, who was a biologist from Chile. Okay, yes, I know, I, yeah, mm -hmm. great. Varela wrote um, about the concept of neurophenomenology. Mm. And I think we could look together into his work to see if there's something that would be useful to this conversation. Um, then, what you were also describing um, makes me think of the experience of movement in a collective when we expand. So uh, in um, thinking about um, think about the way we conceive a map of the body, a map of the space, Sometimes uh, if we use uh, uh, props or um, other uh, equipment, we may map that in our body-mind system. I'm just thinking that in, when, you, when I hear you talking, I, I imagine and I experienced in dancing collectively an expansion of physical uh, reach and or boundaries. So when you said interdependence, um, the and I and I I'm curious if uh, Varela in uh, neurophenomenology described this because he was working with embodied cognition. Um, that sense of merging, I think, the superorganism that Karen was talking about. So I don't know if that sense of becoming a superorganism in the act of participating was maybe described in neurophenomenology. Um, I would be curious to see that. I, I don't know. It's a great question. No, thank you. Awesome. Yeah, we keep talking. Sakurula, <laughs> did you have a question, comment? You're muted, yeah. Hello, everyone. It's nice to hear Christina also, <laughs> uh, because Hi. she was uh, hello. She was my first contact uh, with the limbs oh. and Laban. Uh, I did the fundamentals with Christina, and it was the only thing I did with Laban. So many things I don't understand them really well, um, but I'm trying. It's, it's the third time for me that I'm organizing and choreographing the global water dances in Greece, in Thessaloniki. And um, as I was here, I, I said about the, hand, the 100 language about the children, <laughs> because I'm an educator. So I, I see it in my classrooms every day with my kids uh, in the dance school and in the, my school, because I'm a kindergarten teacher also. So I can see 
um, more after the quarantine uh, that they were they have a really really uh, bad connection with their bodies with um, with the every kind of art and uh, things going worse uh, so I think that global water dance in June is going to be an opportunity to come back in our reality before the quarantine I hope you we can do it uh, what I was thinking while you were speaking, everyone, was uh, I think that it's important these eight elements we said um, about uh, uh, synchrony, rhythm, uh, to be obligatory in every dance school. And we have to redefine what dance means, because when we hear dance, uh, as I was hearing Victoria also, uh, many people are afraid that they have to be effective, they have to do something really nice, really beautiful, and they forget that it comes from inside. Uh, so um, I think that we have to start everyone when we're doing our um, global water dances in our countries from that. We have to redefine dance and thank you for sharing that today because it's a great idea for me. Christina, nice to hear you. Thank you for everything. <laughs> Thank you all. Rebecca, did you want to say something about? I just wanted to loop this back into some of the things that we spoke about earlier. It, it's wonderful to see so much rich discussion and exchange coming from this. And it really feels like this is the ripple. This is the community. Thank you for like acknowledging that and and, and reaching out of our boxes. Um, one is to, off of the idea of, of neurophenomenology, that this idea that dance being ontological, like speaking about the world we inhabit, and, and that we collectively create that world. Like dance is not forced upon us. We come into it together, we find it together. And I think that this is a, a, a way in which this question of like, how can we find new ways of being that are egalitarian, that are together, that are unified, we find them through moving into them. And maybe we dance alone, but we can still feel that. Um, and to that, I also wanted to say that as choreographers, the idea of Choreography is that we, we write the body, but we read the body. So part of this, as some people have said, is, is thinking about how can we make people aware of the dance they are already engaged in through seeing it to help them see it. So for instance, in the case of activism, people blocking a road, this is a dance, but maybe it takes the choreographer to point this out for people to feel that and to introduce some, some aspect of expression or awareness to it. And also to think about this idea of where, where does the dance occur? Where is the audience? The audience is constructed because the dance happens. So everything we do has a performative dimension. And I think part of our role as choreographers is to help each other see this so that we are speaking to each other in creating this shared movement. And yes, yeah, so many great things are said here. I'm really so pleased to be part of this. And, and I can I read just the sentence again, because Rebecca, you were talking about this and, and that's the sentence Christina wrote. Could the body in the act of moving collectively constitute equity? I think that that's, you know, an important part of what we're talking about here too, which is not just the dance. The dance matters. The dance, as Vanya says, is the how in the chat, right? The dance is the how. But addressing issues like some of the ones that you've mentioned in the chats, an oil pipeline going through a neighborhood, um, you know, the the issues that Sibele is dealing with in um, the mining issues, um, the kinds of stories that we hear about in global water dances, which are part of the um, documentary as well. This is really tough stuff. You know, it's one thing to dance and, you know, feel good about being together 
and all of that. It's another thing to find the agency together to make a difference, to do actions that actually either, you know, nonviolently impede or, you know, support a group of people who are trying to make changes happen. This is tough stuff, but it requires the investment of our bodies. It requires us to engage in the how. And that, you know, is, I think, where, we, where we're going and where we have to go. We've learned so much over the 10 years about water issues and resistance in these communities around the globe that um, I think that it's, it's really helpful to understand the power of dancing together to make those things possible. Right, the right motivation, as Rena says, right. Mm -hmm. yes. We just have a few more minutes. Does anybody have a burning comment, issue, question? I just want to say thank you for this community and for hosting this webinar about movement choirs. Um, I see that Mary Lee Hardenberg is on the call, and um, I did One River, Mississippi with her many moons ago, and we um, brought a community of diverse people together in order to center ourselves around the Mississippi River. I think what's happening in Memphis right now, um, it's, it's very strange. We had a boil water alert because we had winter weather that we had never experienced before in, in our region, and um, it wasn't safe to drink the water. We have a pipeline that's being proposed to move through right now, and we see um, a grassroots movement among our communities of color here like I've never seen before, like really understanding environmental impact and using their voices to amplify that issue. So I think, whereas I was sort of tentative about whether or not I could commit to doing this in the middle of a pandemic, uh, I, I feel very connected to what's happening with um, this pipeline and with that grassroots group and have been talking to them a lot. So I think there's, I'm hoping, even if it is a small group, I'm hoping that it'll, um, be inviting um, in ways that maybe it wouldn't have before if it was just me in my front yard. So I'm actually going to a rally today um, and I'm talking to those leaders to see how we might be able to connect this. I, I just wanted to jump in and say thank you, uh, Kimberly. Hi, and um, I think Kimberly is representative of everybody on the call, which is she is very creative and when she has a strong intention, she makes it happen. And, and as we were saying, if we were all little stones in this global water and we created our dance, however big or small, it just makes such a great difference. So thank you. Thank you, Mary Lee, for your initiating energy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anybody else wants to jump in and just say something? If we're getting lots of wonderful um, comments and there's a lot of discussion going on in the chat as well, but we're gonna finish in about five minutes. And I just wanted to see if any, Barbara, did you wanna say something? Yeah. Quick, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I only heard about this not even a month ago through Martha Eddy's dance class. So, and I'm here in Burnaby where we have a pipeline coming through and our beautiful water is gonna be in danger from tankers that are coming. And um, I'm, not a, I'm not a big organizer, I'm a dancer. So I put it out to a few people. Um, so I've been, just been gathering information by listening to some of the others, um, events you've had on these Zoom meetings. Uh, and I'm just so excited and moved, literally moved by what I've been hearing today and all of the commitment. Um, and yeah, I'm a little teeny ripple over here in Burnaby. Um, and yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> Anybody else? Just unmute. Oh, I can say something. Hi, I'm Rochelle, and um, uh, I'm working with um, TEM teachers in Chicago Public Schools who are science teachers studying uh, issues of water and social justice. And um, 
we're hoping to get um, one of our teaching artists and a few teachers to have kids make small videos at home on their, you know, on their little screen and share it. So we'll see if that happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wonderful to see you, Rochelle. <laughs> Excellent. So what's next? Go ahead. What's next? What's next? Yeah, Vanya, you want to? Um, we're we've been we've announced the site impact fund. That's out there. There's some uh, possibilities for some funding through that. Um, and also, we have the festival. Bonnie, do you want to talk about what we're actually planning to do? <laughs> After this? Yes, yeah, so we are, <clears throat> for June 2021, we are um, organizing many different things. Also, uh, taking an account that we are now celebrating our 10 years of Global Water Dances, dancing since 2011. And at the same time, uh, taking in account how uh, the different situations in different parts of the world are. So we are, um, yes, this year we are accepting also pre-recorded videos. So if it's not possible for you to, to be there, um, also you can connect with us, um, you know, and, and create your video beforehand and then share with us uh, on, on during that week. So um, all the information is on the four choreographers page and I'm going to put the um, our website here or Natasha, if you can uh, type the, that our website over there. So if you want to be involved, many of you are already uh, with us. <clears throat> so during the week, I'm going to just briefly say on um, June 8th, we're going to start uh, our global water dances with something that we call the splash mop. Uh, it's a one minute dance, very easy to do and everybody uh, <clears throat> can uh, connect through our social media and um, upload their video doing this dance with their own expression. Today we were talking about single choreography but different ways to express yourself. <clears throat> so, that's something that we are doing as an opening, uh, which is also the World Oceans Ocean Day. So uh, we are collaborating with the World Ocean Day in that way. And then we're going to have three days um, showcasing different videos from different uh, parts of the world that are not able to dance um, on Global Water Dances on Saturday. So if you have any video that is related to water, either the rituals or, um, um, it was a ritual, any local dance um, issue, sorry, a local <laughs> issue, water issue. Um, I didn't have my coffee today. <laughs> or the third one is the, um, um, yes, the global dance. And I'm going to talk now about the global dance. So this is the movement choir that uh, we created. It's just five minutes long. And we have the video on our website. It's shown as a solo. You can practice as a solo. You can practice it as a group. If you are able to, you can practice through Zoom uh, with uh, other people who are maybe in the same location. And then you can translate that into uh, our Saturday, June 12th celebration. If you want, if you are able to go um, outside or you can do it through Zoom. So the idea is that you can do it in your, with your group, maybe, you know, people who is far away from each other, maybe you want to interact with somebody who is um, very far away. Um, and at the end on Sunday, we're going to meet as a big group through Zoom. And the idea is to do this global dance and also the participatory dance together. So everything is somewhere in our webpage. And also if you have any questions, just feel free to email us to Karen, to me, Natasha, um, the email uh, info at globalwaterdances.org yep. is the one that you can use. And I think that's it. Woo, I extended a little bit, sorry. <laughs> 
thank you everybody please this is not the end right <laughs> this is the beginning of this conversation and i know that rebecca and chechi and i are really interested in um exploring further in the direction of the social neuroscience piece but um I think that everybody here who's, who wants to do a dance, please use this information. Let it inform you um, in terms of how you're, you know, how you're addressing all of this, how you're thinking about it. Keep in mind that you know becoming a superorganism is a way to go. <laughs> Not a mindless superorganism, but a superorganism of amazing individual people dancing together. So thank you, everybody. Yes, we're going to share this. This will be available. Um, we'll stop the recording and uh, get it ready to share with everybody, including the other hundred and some people who signed up for this who didn't come. So, Shall we do our participatory dance to close? Sure, sure. You we want to say a big thank you to Karen for organizing, a big thank you to Cecilia and Rebecca for your expertise and your passion. Thank you, thank you so much. Such wonderful food for thought, so inspiring, so engaging. Science is dance, neuroscience is dance, dance is neuroscience. We are all neuroscientists. We just have to claim that title. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the inspiration and bringing us into this important work. Thank you. Anya. Anya, take it away. Lead us. Yes, here we go. So take your hands in front of you. Fill the water cup with hands. Holding that within you. Yes. And here we go. Just with a little rhythm that we were learning. Rhythm. Here we go. Water goes up. And the rain comes down. And the water comes in your body, and the water goes out. And the water goes up, and the water comes down. Rain, and the water comes in, splash yourself, and the water goes out. Two more times, water goes up. Breathe in, down to the air. Water comes in, to yourself. And to everybody, one more time. Woo! <laughs> to the world, ripples around. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you for a spectacular time. Thanks. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Thank you. Until Thank you. next time.